afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. John Shrigley, the Provincial Head of Pathology and Lab Medicine Program and also the Chair of the National Pathology Standards Committee for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, the Partnership, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome you to uh, today's uh, educational session on liver and biliary cap cancer protocols presented by Dr. Oyele Ade. This is our speaker, and when we get formally underway, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is a, will be approximately 80 minutes in length and will include about 60 minutes of presentation followed by up to 30 minutes of questions and answers. The session is being recorded and will be made available to all participants via email links once the recording becomes available. The live presentation and the recorded presentation are eligible for CME credits upon the completion and submission of evaluation forms available electronically. The information for accessing the evaluation form was provided in the notice for this session previously distributed. Please note that the CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The recorded sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but the CME certificates are only available for one month. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. Please note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. Due to the large number of participants, we are unable to troubleshoot any WebEx connectivity issues as part of this call. If you're having troubles with the WebEx portion of the teleconference, please WebEx support line at 1-866-229-3239. I encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. For questions on how to use the WebEx chat window, please refer to the documentation previously distributed. Question and answer portion of the presentation. In order to avoid question collisions, I will pose the submitted questions on your behalf as long as time permits and in the order in which they appear. Chat window, please include the following information your institutional name, the name of the individual posing the question, and finally your question. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Oli Adde, who earned his medical degree in 1987 from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He completed residency training in anatomical pathology in Nigeria and later also at Dartmouth Medical School in the United States in 2005. In between two residencies, he did a research fellowship in renal pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston between 1999 and 2000. From both, uh, he proceeded to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center where he completed a fellowship in liver and transplantation pathology with Dr. Jake Demetrius and his team. Since 2006, Dr. A has served as a staff physician and consultant in liver and transplantation pathology and, in, and, and to the Hepatobiliary Oncology Service at the Princess Margaret Hospital University Health Network, Oliver Center at University Health Network, and the multi-organ transplant program at that institution. In addition to his busy clinical practice, Dr. Eddy is active in both clinical and basic science research in transplantation and medical liver diseases, through a number of uh, several publications in peer-reviewed international journals and book chapters. He is a key educator and teacher, making a popular among the University of Toronto pathology residents and the fellows in uh, liver transplant and hepatology. He has traveled, uh, he, he traveled extensively with speaking engagements both locally, nationally, and internationally. Dr. Ed receives consultation requests from pathologists and gastroenterologists across Canada in indication of recognition of his expertise in liver pathology. He's a member of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, the International Liver Transplantation Society, the Canadian Association of Pathologists, and the College of American Pathologists, among other organizations. So without any further ado, I introduce Dr. Ade to give today's talk on the CAP checklist related to the biliary system. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Strickley. Uh, let me apologize to everyone for the slight delay. I, I lost my internet access about 20 minutes to 1 o'clock, so I had to start scuttling around to make alternative arrangements. So without further ado, uh, we're going to be looking at five CAP cancer checklists this afternoon. To begin, I have no financial relationships to disclose, and I will not be discussing any off-label use of investigational use. In the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes, I want to try and define the anatomic landmarks as by the five 
CAP checklist. I also highlight the recent changes uh, since the last update. Uh, most of the time will be spent discussing selected aspects of each uh, checklist. Uh, sometimes we'll be talking about rationale and also try to address uh, confusing or potentially conflicting uh, issues. This is the chart that I borrowed from the AJCC Atlas, and this is my modification of the same chart. So the five checklists we're going to be looking at are color-coded in uh, pink, green, blue, yellow, and uh, lighter blue. So the pink there is the hepatocellular carcinoma, the lighter green is the intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And then we have the perihyla, and we have the distal hepatic bile duct uh, checklist. But I'm going to begin with the gallbladder, which I think is uh, one organ most, almost everybody uh, has to see. So uh, several ways one can get a gallbladder cancer. It could come as a cholecystectomy, or it could come with cholecystectomy and partial hepatectomy, uh, so without lymph node dissection. It is not uncommon to get a gallbladder first, and when the diagnosis of cancer is made, it is followed up a few weeks later with hepatectomy. So what I do uh, in such cases is to upstage the do my challenge if the liver is invaded with a more recent uh, resection. So the um, van that we are talking about today was released in June last year, and that is version 3.1.0.1. And the main difference between this and the previous version is that the endo neuroendocrine carcinoma, the high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, was uh, divided into small cell and large cell. And this is done for all the other five, well, all four of the five uh, checklists that we'll be talking about today, so I won't be repeating this. Um, there's really not much literature in the patobiliary system about the behavior of the high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, but probably uh, some experience from the pulmonary literature was uh, borrowed, you know, to come to this conclusion. Where it is very clear now that the small cell and the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma do not behave in the same way, and uh, the treatment approach is clearly different. So the small cell, uh, usually you will not perform surgery, it's either chemo and or radiation. Last cell neuroendocrine carcinoma could be amenable to resection. So, but um, I couldn't find anything that talks about the hepatobiliary system and how much this difference uh, goes. But where you see this, you know, the two of them are high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. And when you are not sure, you know it's neuroendocrine carcinoma, but you are not sure whether to classify it as small cell and large cell, there's a third category of uh, high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. So this is an example of a gallbladder resection that came with the liver parenchyma. So to be showing this picture towards the end, but the staging of gallbladder carcinoma is dependent on everything that you see in this one picture. So the degree of invasion of the wall, the involvement or non-involvement of the lymph nodes, uh, vascular or no vascular invasion. So those are some of the things that we are going to be looking at in the next uh, few minutes. I will try not to go through checklist line by line because most of the entries are straightforward and you know really not nothing much. So I'm going to concentrate on discussing you know the key issues of um, you know the rationale needs to be understood or where is potential uh, confusion uh, in the checklist. So. For most of them, you're going to have to specify the organs that received, and you're going to specify the procedure, uh, which standard across uh, almost all the checklists. Uh, without um, overemphasizing it, the gross description obviously is very important in how uh, well you're able to complete the checklist when you have to. So being able to determine whether it's at the fundus, body, neck, etc., uh, uh, predominantly is important for data collection. At the end of the day, one of these factor in into the uh, overall staging. Also, the greatest dimension, I realized that this would try to, we should always try to estimate as best as we could 
but as always, the extent of tumor uh, is beyond what could be visible grossly, but all these things need to be entered as much as possible. So this is the list of the customers that are recognized and listed by the AJCC and also uh, are duplicated by the CAP cancer checklist. And these are our two friends, large cell endocrine carcinoma and small cell, which were present in the previous uh, uh, edition. And we have to talk about the grade. It follows pretty much the same rule uh, that it does in other places where you have to deal with adenocarcinoma. So where differentiated means almost all the tumor is comes of glands, and only differentiated means less than 50% of the tumor is composed of uh, glands. When you could not figure that one out, maybe the any glands, then it becomes undifferentiated. So now, in gobbler carcinoma and some of the other hepatobiliary carcinoma, the stage is the single most important prognostic factor of patient outcome. The logic grade, especially when you are dealing with the undifferentiated and the poorly differentiated ones, they also have an impact on survival, but largely because the uh, poorly differentiated tumor tends to also be the one with the higher stage. So pay attention to the staging and um, all the things that go into the staging. Uh, one other thing about the neuroendocrine carcinoma that is emphasized in the checklist is that you see scatter areas of neuroendocrine cells in an adenocarcinoma, especially the poorly differentiated one, that would not qualify as a neuroendocrine carcinoma. So that would still be adenocarcinoma, and you still have to grade it like an adenocarcinoma. You might mention that they are foci of neuroendocrine uh, cells. Many of us have seen signal uh, mucosal with um, macrophages engulfing myosin that could sometimes look like a signet ring. So one needs to be careful uh, not to miscall because by the time you say signet ring, you are talking of a high grade, at least a grade three adenocarcinoma. Uh, and any time you have to use the small cell carcinoma, uh, you know you are going to check the undifferentiated uh, form of the grading, uh, small cell carcinoma. Now these are the things that determine whether you are dealing with a T1, T2, T3, or a T4. Tumor, how deeply into the wall it is invaded. So, invasion of the lamina propria, uh, muscle layer, etc. And I'm just going to show you some pictures of examples uh, of this. And of course, the margins, primary is the cystic duct margin uh, that we are looking at. When it comes with liver resection, there is a second margin, which is going to be the parenchyma resection margin especially if the tumor has invaded into the liver parenchyma. So that becomes an important uh, resection margin you have to talk about. So the cancer committee of the CAP wants to emphasize that complete surgical resection and negative margins are very important. So patients with negative margins have 30 years better five survivor than those with positive uh, margins. The other things which I won't go into because they are just uh, straightforward lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion. Now you are going to see MRY in virtually all the checklists of the CAP. So M means multiple R recurrent by uh, post treatment section. So you can check if uh, any of this is uh, relevant. So this is where the most discussion along the uh, the gallbladder protocol will be centered. So this is straightforward. PC1 tumor means the tumor is within the wall, either in the lamina propria, which is T1A, or it has gone through the muscle layer. And then PT2 means it has gone into the perimuscular layer, but it has not gone into the soft tissue, and it has not gone into the liver parenchyma. When it gets into the liver parenchyma, it becomes a PT3. Now, PT3 is a very generous. Uh, for gallbladder because it, it can invade a lot of things and still be PT3. So it can the liver and the stomach or duodenum, colon, pancreas, and it will still be T3. It be T4 when it invades more than one of these other things. So apart from the liver, any two of these, when they are invaded at the same time, it becomes T4 automatically. 
So when you can demonstrate that stomach and duodenum, for instance, are involved by God, brother, then that's a T4. And the way to get to the T4 is when the main portal vein is invaded. So examples of PT1 to PT3, this is an insight to carcinoma of a papillary carcinoma there that is not invading uh, uh, the lamina propria. And here you see the invasion of the lamina propria and the muscularis. So that's the PT. One B, so it's still within the one. When it goes into beyond the muscle into the uh, into the serosa without going outside, like you see here. So this is the edge of the serosa. It is a T2. Crosses into the fat beyond the serosa, it becomes a PT3. And if you are looking at a tumor that is seen on the gallbladder bed, it is possible that because there are also soft tissue there. So it is possible that it, is, it has invaded into the liver. So that becomes a PT3. So the question is always that of a PT4, because you will never see a PT4 if the description was not well done. So this example of a patient who had a gallbladder resection um, a few weeks before the liver section came. So the gallbladder carcinoma was a surprise. It wasn't diagnosed prior to surgery. And so they went back and had a liver resection. And the tumor is obviously invading the liver. So the question here is, uh, if this is all, that would be a PT3 because it's invading the liver. If it's invading the portal vein, that would be a PT4. So you need to, if you use PA, you need to instruct them to carefully look for portal vein, the main branch, whatever the major branch that is a company or resection, they need to look for. So I think this is a portal vein here. And so the tumor is encasing it. It has to be sampled generously because that is important. Um, the uh, distinction between the PT3 and the PT4. There. Now, the other issue with the gallbladder checklist is that of uh, N2 classification. So I double question mark there. This forward, when there's no lymph node, then there's no lymph node. When there's lymph node in the portal hepatitis, then there is N1. When there's lymph node division away from the portal hepatitis, so if you look at this, generally you can say into the uh, retroperitoneum. So periaortic area, the pericava, superior mesenteric artery, and the celiac artery are there. So when you see involvement of those, is a PN2. So I'll tell you why I put question mark there in a minute. So you talk about all the, you know, the things we usually do, how many lymph nodes, and how many are involved or not involved, and then we talk about PM1, if we know it. So this is where I put question mark on the PN2. In the comments that come at the end of the checklist, M1 is defined as involvement of superior mesenteric and celiac lymph node. Those are the lymph nodes that are classified as N2. In this. So it's either the N2 or M1. Uh, is, so you have to. So I had a discussion with uh, the cancer committee people in the last one week. There, there, there's been a lot of emails up and down asking them to clarify uh, some things. And so that's what you know I pointed out to them. And I think if there's an update in this year on, in the coming years, uh, that is probably going to be addressed. Uh, the other thing is that the peripancreatic notes in not M1. So when you read the notes, you are still going to see this entry, but this, this is not N1. This is not M1. This is still N1. So this is one of the questions that was posed to them by email recently, and uh, you know the question was, should N2 include the periduodenum and peripancreatic, and both the CCC and the CAP said no. So that is an error, and this is their comment that they will be deleting that. So when you read the notes and you see M1, the M1 is second superior mesenteric lymph nodes, not the peripatic. So I think the easy way to think about it, if it goes towards the retroperitoneum, it is M1. It is still within the portal hepatitis and along the uh, pancreas, then it is still N1. So that is the uh, easy way to look at it. So what I do um, is when I see something that looks like N2, I check N2, but I also check N1. Does it matter? Ultimately, no, it doesn't. Either N2 or M1 will get you to stage 4B. 
If you look at the group standings, uh, only anyone comes from uh, up to three. Stage three. Once you start getting N2, it carries the same weight as M1 anyway, so it will be stage 4B. So it doesn't really matter what to call it, it's just that the confusion is there, and I hope, I think that is going to be removed uh, in the coming section. question with the gallbladder protocol is, when tumor invades the liver like this, this is a T3. But what about these nodules? These are not direct invasions. So this is the leading edge of the tumor in the soft tissue or a liver not here. So in here and there, there's quite a distance to travel, and then you see that single nodule. So this is M1. This is not N. This is not T3. Here, invading the liver will be T3. This will be M1. And something to pay attention to. So that means when you have a resection with the liver, you want to make sure that, that the goblet is not removed. Everything is sectioned inside too so that you'll be able to define whether there's a direct spread or whether you are dealing with uh, meds. This is important because if there's here, then there's nothing stopping this patient having metastasis in the other portion of the liver that has not been uh, resected. So I, that was also discussed with the CAP group. And they said, yes, that should be M1, not uh, uh, T3. So the other Part of the things in the gallbladder, what else you see? Cholecystitis, stone, and all those things have to be entered. So about the gallbladder, it's fairly straightforward. A few things that one needs to pay attention to. The remaining four I've divided into the tripartic bile duct and the intrahepatic components. So each of them have to. So let's look at the perihilar and the distal bile duct uh, checklist. Off. Between the gista and the perihyla is the junction of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. So the perihyla casina it begins from where you can define the right and left hepatic ducts, confluence of those two ducts all the way through the length of the common hepatic duct. Junction of the cystic so that would be the perihyla. So portion of this will be outside the liver, and a small portion of it will be just within the liver in the hilum. It is very, very important to know where the tumor sits. I will see why in the next uh, few minutes. Because if you have a perihyla and you are using a extra common bile or checklist, you are going to message the tumor. And it really matters, I think, big time. So I will show you as we go on. So this is a resection that looks like what we saw before, but in this, this is actually a tumor that started from the hilar area and has invaded right uh, into the liver. The liver into it looks very fibrotic because of the uh, extended period of obstruction to that bile duct. So the version here again was released the same time, uh, June 2012, and that's the version that we are talking about. Again, the neuroendocrine carcinoma in these cases were uh, better refined into small and large cells, and then there's a category for high grade, uh, as you see. So I won't go through this. You select again what you received, uh, the specimen, the procedure, and the site. And this is where one pay the most attention. So you see here that we are dealing with perihyla, and by definition, the common bile ducts should not even be using this checklist. So if tumor is in the common bile duct, then you should be using the distal bile duct checklist. But it is not unusual that you see a tumor that is centered on the common hepatic duct, but extends directly into the common bile duct. So this is the primary decision that the pathologist has to make. When you get that tumor, where is the center? Is it distal or is it proximal? It's very, very important to make that decision up front. Most of the time, the radiologist will help you because they will have done MRCP and they will usually tell you where they think the main mass is. It is easier to read radiology than to actually try to look for the exact location of the mass. But if you don't have the radiologist to help, the radiology report to help you, then you have to make every effort to know where the tumor is centered, even if it extends distally or approximately as the case may be. 
So, but if it affects the common bulk door, then it needs to be checked. So here you can check more than one, uh, all the things that are affected, including the cystic dot. Again, we see all the tumors that need to be talked about. Now, this is the time you do not use cholangiocarcinoma. So, frankly, we use the word extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Technically speaking, it's nothing like extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So, cholangiocarcinoma is adenocarcinoma of the intrahepatic bile ducts. When outside the liver or is in the high lung, it should be called the perilla adenocarcinoma or common bile duct adenocarcinoma, whatever it is. So, um, hopefully, every the, you know, the, there will be uniformity as to that uh, category. And Japanese, forever, they've never actually used cholangio for anything that is not inside the liver. So, this is a North American and European problem uh, for the most part. So, that is going to change, hopefully, uh, as uh, more people use this. Now, this is important to differ very highly from DISTA. This is one of the things I was talking about. So, when I start talking about the tumor extension, when the tumor affects a unilateral branch of port vein, it's to a different stage than when it affects the unilateral branch of that vein or hepatic artery. I will show you in the next uh, uh, a few charts. So this is the T staging. T for perioral depends on where the portal or hepatic artery on one side is involved. If it affects both sides, it becomes a PT4. And this is not an issue when you are dealing with a disc, and I will show you, you know, when we get to this hepatic factor. So this is why you first have to make that decision that you are dealing with a perioral and if it affects both sides, contralateral veins, then it's also a PT4. So that is one of the reasons why, you know, one needs to, to show. And again, this is just uh, the same thing that we saw in the gallbladder. Okay, again, we see our PN2 friend. It says the same thing here. The other thing is, so far, PN2 has not been defined as PM1, the perihelia. So remember, in the gallbladder, PN2 is uh, going to become PM1. So I think in the gallbladder, the PN2 category is going to disappear entirely and just going to have PM1. That will include those lymph nodes. Uh, again, PN2 here is giving the same weight as M1, just like it was in the gallbladder. And so, pay attention. Now, this is one of the caveats. So this would be a PT2 lesion because this is a hyalur anocarcinoma that is not invading the liver. So I put this particular picture there because almost always there will be ductular reaction at the interface between the liver and the tumor. So and some of these duct reaction could actually look atypical. So we want to be very careful not to overcall the ductular action as evidence of invasion into the liver and chyma. So this is an, a true invasion. So this is the liver uh, tissue all the way here, and this is the tumor invading and eating right into the liver parenchyma. It's very subtle, but this is positive. So this will be a PT2B and PT2A uh, in that case. The other things that uh, you probably, you see, you know, you try to document them, dysplasia, PSC, and this will be pathology findings. But most of the time, you know, you also need to know if there's a history of PSC or inflammatory bowel disease, which are some of the risk factors for this uh, cancer. In, in young patient. Now, the dyspepatic dot, so remember the blue here is the perihelia, and from this junction downwards, it becomes the dyspepatic dot. It does not include the ampulla, so there's a separate checklist for the ampulla of Vata, which we are not going to be talking about today. Uh, that comes with the Whipple resection. So, but this is the distal common bile dot uh, checklist. And again, made the same change about the neuroendocrine carcinoma, in addition, they find the listing of all the margins, recognizing that this could have come as a Whipple procedure, uh, where you have the pancreatic, uh, pancreatectomy and all those things that you get with a Whipple algae. So it's not really such a big change from the previous one. It's just that everything is now listed in order so that you can just check all the margins that are present, whether they are involved or not will be 
specify. Uh, so I won't go through this one by one because it gets straightforward. So let's put periha and the distal bile duct side by side so that we can see why I was emphasizing the importance of the tummy right from the point of grossing where the tumor is centered. And one thing I didn't say again is that when they when there's a perihilar tumor and they are resecting it, they tend to dissect the entire extra hepatic biliary tree, including the common bile duct. So you're going to get everything. So hopefully the the gallbladder will be dissected together. So that way it makes it easy for you to know the junction of the cystic duct with uh, the uh, hepatic duct. So we need to make that decision up front. Um, I don't think I can overemphasize that uh, too much. So, because the stain will be different, you know, depending on which uh, one that you are using here. And again, the perihyla, of course, I mentioned the issue of the N2, which is uh, the periotic and pericava uh, lymph nodes. Unlike in the gallbladder, the same thing is still M1. And here it still remains as L2 in the peri peri Hyler, whether it will become M1 straight on in the future or not, I, I can't predict. But whatever happens, whether it's N2 or M1, it's due to the same uh, final tumor grouping. So these are the tumor groupings. Again, 4B is N2 or N1. It doesn't really matter what to call it, you are going to get. The, pair, the distal hepatic dog doesn't have an N2 category. And uh, so it's but you need to know what constitutes use the uh, renal lymph node. Now, I think the biggest problem in these resections for the pathologist is recognizing the proximal bile duct margin. What is the proximal bile duct margin? So this is, an, this is a schema of what the surgeon does. So let's assume this man has a hilar or perihilar carcinoma that has extended slightly into the common bile duct, but it's entered at the junction of the right and left hepatic duct. The surgeon could the right lobectomy with the second of the extra hepatic bile duct. And so this is what you get. So the distal margin is okay. That is the distal end of the common bile duct. That will be the distal margin. In very liver parenchyma, the distance between the tumor and the parenchyma resection end is parenchyma resection margin. That's usually is straightforward. This is margin that is always a problem. So they will have resected the left hepatic duct somewhere. There will be a stump here that if you, are, if you don't know to look for it, it's never obvious and it's very difficult to identify. So what most of our surgeons here do when you go to this place, save it up and submit it separately, a separate uh, uh, specimen, and they call it for you. So when that's done, it makes your life easy. We we'll still need to see where the rest of the stump is, uh, just in case you know I, I need to put everything together in the future. But it is very, very nice and useful to, to speak with your surgeon and tell them that if they have to do this, could they please kindly shave the proximal margin and send it as a speci uh, separate specimen? Sometimes it comes as a frozen section, and. Uh, that's it. Even if they don't plan to do a frozen section, it is you know worthwhile uh, sending it because again, complete section is uh, probably the most important determinant of cure in this uh, tumor. So there are questions about those two checklists. The tumor size we try to document it, but it doesn't really factor into the uh, final staging. Uh, tumor crossing the common hepatic duct and the common bile duct extensively. Okay, if just slight crossing, then you, you need to determine where the tumor is centered so as to use the right checklist. But what, what of when you have a field effect where tumor is just everywhere and you just can't tell? You know, so it becomes a matter of guesswork which one to use. So what I do in these cases is that uh, I would stage it in my head with both and I will figure out which one has the higher stage. And I'll go with that and I'll put a comment to the oncologist and say, well, I can't really say whether this one is centered on the common hepatic uh, duct or whether it's in the common bile duct, uh, which represents two anatomic uh, locations. And I will tell them I'm for using one or the other.
So that doesn't talk about uh, that's not discussed in the checklist. Cholidosis, especially in teenagers and children, eh, could be completed with uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, so you have to first go back and figure out where what type of cholidosis, depending on its location, and that should determine the kind of uh, checklist that is used. So the perihyla and the distal hepatic uh, bowel duct carcinoma. Let's go into the Proxima checklist, so the ones, the two within the liver parenchyma proper, that is the hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. So recently, there used to be, recently, I'd say about five years ago or so, there used to be only one checklist for both hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. So now this is the time we are allowed to use the term cholangiocarcinoma for intrahepatic uh, bile duct carcinoma. So the red or the pink area, that will be the parenchyma. I've seen um, in particular uh, neoplasm described as a uh, 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 hepatocellular carcinoma consistent with cholangiocarcinoma. There's actually nothing like that. It's either hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma. Now, the channel is probably oversimplified assume that hepatocellular carcinoma originates from differentiated hepatocytes that became neoplastic versus cholangiocarcinoma that originated from biliary epithelium that became uh, transformed into neoplasia. That is the assumption. But we all know that that is not always true. If at all, it's possible for stem cells to uh, start off a tumor and to differentiate either towards hepatocellular features or towards uh, cholangiocarcinoma features. And that is really well uh, documented already. So but the function makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to show you some of the rationale that uh, uh, makes it important to be able to use the terminal differentiation to stage these uh, tumors. Now, once to the intrahepatic location, everything, you know, location, 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 like the real estate people say, is very important. Now, when in the medical school, I was taught that the left lobe of the liver is uh, smaller than the right lobe. And that was because the falciform ligament was believed to be the separation between the left lobe and the right lobe. Now we know embryologically and anatomically that that is not true. So line corresponds to where you see the middle hepatic vein. So the middle hepatic vein actually separates the liver into the right and the left lobe. So we know that both the right and the left lobe, they are almost about the same size. Okay. So this passiform ligament looks very promising and enticing, but this is not the midway between the, uh, this is not the separation between the left and the right. This is the, so the middle hepatic vein is what you want to see. When, about the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, you will see why it is important to determine whether the tumor is on the left, right, here, or is on the is on the right. I'll show you in a minute. This is just to remind us. So this is the middle hepatic vein that separates the liver into the left and the right lobe, and the fasciform ligament will have been somewhere here. So with the fasciform ligament and the true junction is uh, segment four. And I go into the coinoid uh, segment, uh, the divisions of the liver, but this is a very good uh, chart that uh, says it's from the same AJCC atlas. So this part is important to define right lobe and left lobe when you are dealing with angiocarcinoma. When you have a right lobe cholangiocarcinoma, what constitutes region lymph node is slightly different from what constitutes regional lymph node in the left. So for instance, in the left, you can have gastrohepatic group of lymph nodes and it will still be N1. You have extension into this lymph node in the right lobe, it is no longer N1, that is M1. So just by knowing which side the tumor is already tells you, you know, it's not like you are dealing with, with two different organs with you know similar uh, tumor. And so you see lymph node invasion outside of any of these records primary location, it becomes a PM1 in those cases. 
This is a summary of the intrahepatic uh, bile duct carcinoma. And uh, what we see here again, the same changes about neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma. Ah, uh, compatocellular and cholangiocarcinoma should be staged as a cholangiocarcinoma. So this type of tumor, and I was talking about stem cells a few minutes ago, uh, we, be, we be that this is an example of a tumor that started from the stem cell and differentiates into both hepatocellular and cholangiocarcinoma. So all these patients also tend to have cirrhosis, just like hepatocellular carcinoma, but genetic studies suggest that they will be like cholangiocarcinoma. Also, in terms of response to treatment, they behave more like cholangiocarcinoma. So when these patients have radiofrequency ablation, which sometimes is very, very good for hepatocellular carcinoma, is usually not very good for cholangiocarcinoma. When you have this combined tumor, you want to use the checklist and not the hepatocellular carcinoma checklist. This is an example of a recent uh, mixed hepatocellular and cholangiocarcinoma that I saw. And the most solid area is the hepatocellular component and the darker sprinkling of the cells at the colon as the adeno. And sometimes it's not very easy to determine you know, what you are dealing with, whether it's cholangio or an adeno. So immunostains could be of help. So this is CK7. Um, not, don't use CK19 because hepatocellular carcinoma, when it's poorly differentiated, could be CK19 positive. So it doesn't make it cholangio. CK7 also could be positive in some hepatocellular carcinoma, but not as frequently as likely to see CK19. So this is a very helpful stain that shows you the negative area for CK7 is hepatocellular aspect. And the that are steady car and these invasive uh, features are the uh, adeno, the cholangio aspect. So there are areas with more cholangio in this tumor that I'm that I'm not sure. This is another uh, area. And here on the right, I'm showing you two areas of intermediate phenotype. So the pale steady area are neither here nor there. They are intermediate between cholangio and hepatocellular carcinoma, and the darker ones are the true cholangio in this space. So we are not sure you could try. It doesn't always uh, resolve it, but it's important because when once you document that there's a cholangio component to the tumor, then the checklist that you use becomes uh, different. So, I'm going to a particular checklist in a minute, but to show that the, you know, some of the other reasons why you want to use this, the right checklist, for a particular carcinoma, Size is everything. In the cholangiocarcinoma, we like to know the size, but the size actually doesn't really matter in the ultimate stage. So it is stage is what you uh, want to talk about here. How extensive the tumor is, irrespective of the size. And sometimes it's very even difficult to determine what the actual size if the infiltrative edges are very irregular. So, so it matters, and I'm going to show you when we get to the hepatocellular checklist. Now, the bold circle around PT4, because this is one area of the intrahepatic list that doesn't really make a lot of sense, uh, so to say. I'll tell you why it doesn't make sense in a, in a little while. Okay, so another reason why, you know, you want to start a uh, hepatocell on the left here and the collateral on the right. So the regional lymph node metastasis is has a specific definition with cholangio, depending on whether you are dealing with the right side or left sided cholangiocarcinoma, which is not the case uh, in hepatocellular carcinoma. So, so this before, uh, which is what I just talked about. Now, you want to specify the underlying parenchyma status as much as possible. The reason being that, unlike every other tumor, the tumor is absolutely responsible for the prognosis. In cell tumor, the tumor and the underlying liver together means the prognosis. So for instance, we that somebody with fibrolamella hepatocellular carcinoma would do better than somebody with uh, regular cellular carcinoma because fibrolamella tends to occur in younger children with pristine liver parenchyma and that is the reason why they do better. With the regular HCC 
did a tattoo call in, with a cirrhotic background. So the underlying parenchyma is very important for you to report, and that's also important even when you are dealing with a needle biopsy. We don't stage needle biopsy for this tumor. We only stay resection, but it's important to always look for the background parenchyma because that may determine how far. And if a patient has not been resected, if you tell them it's cirrhotic, that might be the reason why they will not go for resection because they might not be able to uh, uh, reassure the patient or themselves that the remaining parenchyma will sustain the patient. So by margin, okay, this is another time when you have to, whether there's invasive carcinoma, but you also have to look for whether there's dysplasia or not in the bile dot margin. Intrahepatic cholangio could be mass forming or peridoctal infiltrating. And so this is the, the one I want to talk about, the peridoctal infiltrating uh, pattern. Most of the congio you are going to see are mass forming. And another terminology they will use when they send it to you will be peripheral cholangio carcinoma. Noma. And so that's assuming that the bile does start from the periphery and they go to the central to become the highlighter. So the difference between so those people that used to use cholangio for both, they will call the intrahepatic peripheral and they will call the highlighter central. But like I said, it's better to you know resist the restrict the terminology cholangio to intrahepatic. So let's look at the so this is what the checklist again looks like. And I won't go you know, through it one by one. Uh, this is just talking about the, the, this aspect. So it, it, it specifies you are dealing with the partial patectomy. So patectomy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's important when you are dealing with a minor, which is three segments. So each of this is a segment. So a left lobectomy, that's a major patectomy because it has more than three segments already, uh, and so on. Go through this. This is just what the checklist looks like. Every, most of the things are straightforward. But let's go back to the PT4 issue. Look at PT3. It says the tumor perforates the peritoneum, that's the liver capsule, and it involves the extrahepatic structure by direct spread. So that's enough, and that's the PT3. But PT4 means the peridoctal invasion. So what is peridoctal invasion that is so bad and worse than the PT3? This is the definition of peridoctal invasion. It is probably intrahepatic, but then you see cholangio that is diffused along the intrahepatic back dots on both gross and microscopic. It should be on either the gross or microscopic examination. And this automatically becomes a T4. So the question I post to the CP folks is how come this is worse? There's something that is already outside the liver. And even if it's invading the stomach, it is still a PT3. But when it's within the liver, it's a PT4. So that doesn't make sense. And I still don't know why. And when asked, uh, you know, they accepted that well, it's counterintuitive. This came from a Japanese literature. And, uh, I tried to read the paper to see why, what was the data, you know, that showed that PT4 is going to behave worse than PT3. And it's not very clear why. So, but it could be an issue of resectability, but it's as diffuse as they talk about, knowing that surgery is the mainstay of uh, cholangio carcinoma, so tumors potentially could be very difficult to resect. So that would make sense if that is the rationale for a PT4. Uh, right now, it's something to take into consideration, but it also means that when such peridoctal infiltration, you, you want to be able to document it because that automatically pushes it to a PT4 in these patients. So I talked about the regional lymph nodes already, so I won't be saying much about that uh, again. Let's go to the last checklist, which is the hepatocellular carcinoma, and I think we have about uh, five, ten minutes to do that. So in particular localization, again, I talked about location, location, location. So remember, the middle hepatic vein is probably your best friend because it tells you whether you are dealing with a right or a left lobe uh, tumor. So air size matters a lot. I see when we get to the T staging. Now, 
and this is some of the papers there are so many so i just put these two there to show why we deal with uh, size so tumor size is a direct predictor of vascular invasion and if you look at the so the tumors that you can do with liver transplant is hepatocellular carcinoma. And the criteria for qualifying patients for transplant when they have hepatocellular carcinoma, one of the criteria is that the tumor must be less than 5 cm. So that is what we call the Milan criteria. So it's very important that you call, uh, you get the tumor right. Now, if you get a resection that is uh, 4.9 cm, and it's a simple single tumor, you want to be sure and measure it properly that it's 4.9 because remaining 0 0.1 may be the difference between patients subsequently qualified for transplant or not. So, you know, sometimes the radiologist call a tumor 6 cm and you come back and you call it 4.9 cm. That is a big QA because the patient may have been rejected from transplant because of the size. That the radiologist measure it, and now you are saying that this patient could have been considered for transplant. So it matters a lot, and that's why you need to really be sure that your measurement, I mean, whatever you measure is what you see. I always recommend that people measure fresh. So as the tumor, as the resection is coming in, it uh, gets the section, which is what we do here, and the measurement fresh is what we use. After fixation, there's some shrinkage. Uh, the tumor. And if the tumor was uh, necrotic in the center, you may, instead of having shrinkage, you may actually have the tumor looking bigger after fixation. So it's very difficult to compare post fixation measurements uh, between uh, two processes. So it's better you measure fresh and you document it as uh, if it's way bigger than 5 or if it's way less than 5, it's not as important. But 5 cm is the, is the big uh, number. The summary of the changes in epicellular carcinoma was that they talked about the lymph, uh, the lymph nodes and they made it possible to say no lymph nodes were submitted. And even in the past, you just have to say something, otherwise you couldn't finish it. So now there's a category that says there's no lymph node uh, submitted in this. Again, the other change here is that they, so in the past they coded. So when you look at the fibrosis score, if the patient has cirrhosis, they called F1. And first, if the patient had mild or moderate fibrosis or not, then you would have coded it F2. And I think people complain, how could F2 be less severe than F1? So the current one now changes. So if there's no fibrosis, it's F0 code. And the F1 for severe cirrhosis remained the way it was. And what I talked about the major and minor hepatectomy, what that means. It's talking about each one of these segments. If it's three more, it's major. Okay. Now, the problem with the hepatocellular checklist, there are a few problems. Here, you can talk about solitary or multiple. And most especially who work in transplant center where we get explants, we know that multiple tumors are very, very common. I would say about 50% of our patients transplanted for hepat hepatoma have more than one tumor. So you can specify which one, but it does not give any instruction about which one of those multiple to enter the stage. So I'm going to show you. Although they put a comment that if you have multiple tumors, you should submit sections from each one of the tumors. And when there's multiple tumor, it is regarded as multiple rather than in hepatic metastasis of, uh, of a single tumor. So it makes a lot of sense because there's no way you can tell whether it's multiple or intrahepatic meds. So if it's more than one, just treat them like more than one. And don't bother to determine whether it's uh, metastatic or not. So what we have done at UHN to deal with multiple uh, tumor, we, and of, of course, the another issue is that I didn't talk about previously treated hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there's really no room. So this is what we have done. We entered tumor three times. So we have a first tumor, and we do the checklist like we are supposed to do it. You know the size, the histologic type, and, and then able to we make it possible to be able to do the same thing for up to three tumors. So second and third tumors. So we we have that. And when a patient has more than three tumors, 
then we add up the diameter of the remaining tumor and we say number so if there's four or five more tumors for and then the aggregate diameter of all those four we put here so this is this is our local uh, modification and each one if you look at it we also put ablation so this is not part of the original this is not from the CAP because here we see a lot of patients that are treated with radiofrequency ablation and then they subsequently had a resection or they had transplant and their tumor needs to be staged. And so looking at an ablation site, sometimes the ablation is complete, 100%. So you don't even have the ability to say whether it's moderately or poorly differentiated because there's no tumor there, it's just as you. So we've done this and we're going to be suggesting this to the CAP Cancer Committee you know, to put it in the subsequent one. So that's some of the problems with multiple tumor. If you're sticking with the CAP checklist the way it is, uh, you just have to guess which one of the tumors. If one is dominant, then it's not such a big decision to make. Uh, but, you know, it's not uncommon that you see a lot of tumors that are about the same size and they are multiple. So that's what we've done here. Otherwise, uh, there's really nothing much to... Uh, indicate or talk about uh, with the hepatocellular carcinoma protocol, except to now go and end the talk with the staging. If you look at the staging, I think I have a chart here. So T1 means there's a single tumor. With it, it doesn't go out, and that's T1. So even if it's a 5CM tumor, as long as it's not invading the, the vessel, it is a T1. T2 means you have more than one tumor but none of those two tumors is up 5 cm. Or you have a single tumor, that tumor has a microscopic or macroscopic vascular invasion. So that takes you to a T2. Single with vascular invasion or multiple, none of them up to 5 cm is a T2. T is when you have multiple tumors and one of them, at least, you need just one, than 5 cm. So that bumps it from T2 to T3. You can also get to T3 when you have a single tumor irrespective of the size, although we know that size is almost always a surrogate for vascular invasion. So when the tumor is any size but has invaded into a major branch of the vein, usually it's the portal vein or the hepatic artery, that becomes a T3. And when you have the tumor going outside, break through the liver capsule, it becomes a T4. So no matter whether it just breaks out, it could come to the diaphragm, it could be into the stomach or anything. So but once it has broken outside the tumor capsule, it becomes a T4. So it means that when you, so many subcapsular tumors are going to pock the capsule. And sometimes you don't even know that it's breaking through or it's just, you know, retracting the capsule. So what I do is I ink the air pumping and I take sections. So you see evidence that there's tumor, no matter how small, or how microscopic. Once it's outside that liver capsule onto the other side, it becomes a T4 tumor. And it's very important because that there's enough data to show that if this was transplant, almost always those patients will have recurrent hepatocellular carcinoma within a year of two or two of their post-transplant. So everything else is straightforward. The lymph nodes is going to be the other lymph nodes if it is there, and you need to specify how many, uh, etc. Again, the disease, presence or absence of cirrhosis, you want to specify that. And if you know the etiology of cirrhosis, of course, yeah, that one also has to be specified. So these are some of the issues that have not been addressed. Uh, well, some other important points and some issues. If histopathology is a uh, variant of hepatocellular carcinoma you are dealing with, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> so there's no point saying it's a clear cell hepatocellular carcinoma or uh, steatotic hepatocellular carcinoma. It doesn't really matter. The only variant that matters is the fibromyelar variant. So that needs to be specified if that's what you are dealing with. I think about multiple tumors and I talked about what we do, but what if you multiple tumor, one of them is hepatocellular, and one of them is mixed hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma. I actually had one of those problems recently. This ideally should be two different checklists. 
So you use two different checklists for the same resection, or do you just go with the one with the hair stage? And I don't really have a good answer for that. So what I did in this case, I went with the hair stage, and I used the hepatocellular collagio please, but then I put a comment there that the HCC one will be so, so, so stage if I choose that. So that's another problem with the hepatocellular carcinoma checklist that I believe or I hope will be resolved in the future. Lastly, there's a variant of hepatocellular carcinoma called serotomimetic HCC. And this is the example of that. Everything is actually hepatocellular carcinoma. So there's no major nodule, there's no minor nodule. So everything green there is HCC. And most times this uh, pattern of HCC is not even diagnosed by the radiologist because there's really no mass lesion that stands out uh, for them to diagnose. So when you get this as explant, which is what we did here, um, again, to do with the checklist is, um, is not clear because there's really no single tumor to do. So sometimes we do because we, all, we have to enter a checklist. So sometimes what I do is um, enter this and then I put the rest and I say multiple innumerable. But the most important thing is for your oncologist and clinicians to know uh, what the problem is. So those are some of the problems with this. And I think at this point I'm going to stop and um, enter take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayadeli. Um are there any questions from the uh, the, mem the members of the pathology community that are on the lines? We don't see anything in the chat window yet. And just wondering whether anybody has any questions. Speaker, it was a very uh, a very lovely and complete uh, talk, but there must be some some questions out there, I would think. I'm raised on hand. I mean, someone. We don't have anything in the chat window here. Um, it seems to be coming up. I I think if we don't have any um, things, something's popping up in the window now. If there's a um, a room that say I would like to propose suggest that all synoptic reports have uh, definitions of T and N. Is that a question for me? Yeah, I don't know. It's a comment. It, it. I don't know if it's a question. It's more of a comment. Yeah, if you, if we didn't enough time to go through. Each one to four, one by one. So what I just emphasize are the ones that may have some question in uh, determining how to grade them. But if you access to the original, to the CAP document at least, there's a definition of what is T1, what is T2, etc. In, in uh, most of the checklist. And some of them are just what you see in the checklist that I showed you. So T1 for gallbladder, for instance, they will tell you is invasion of the lamina propria. So I don't know if uh, one is looking for any better definition than that. And T1B, of course, when it goes into the muscular is a layer of the gallbladder. So there's much definition. And when it's very complex, there's something more towards the end of the checklist. So I will refer you to the CAP website, and you can always download all this checklist and read their comments. Yeah. There. I think the, uh, I think the explanatory notes sections in those checklists, uh, you know, do do consistently include the TNM information available. So I think I think there's a lot of information in there if uh, people are to read it. Now we have a question. Uh, this just came up, Boy Delhi. In chronic cholecystitis, sometimes we see dysplasia. How do you handle these cases? And if there is dysplasia associated with chronic cholecystitis, do you submit the whole specimen? After the last part is yes. If you achieve is high grade dysplasia, if it's grade dysplasia, I would at least go back and submit a lot more. 
the the easy thing will be to just submit the entire thing. Once you see now, there's a lot of things that is taken for displacure in uh, cholecystitis, especially when there is a lot of stone that really not displacure. But to confirm, say yes, this is displacure. What I do when I see one and I'm not sure, I show it to two or three people, and sometimes I get two out of three consensus. Sometimes it's uh, unanimous. And then we just go back and submit everything. There's another question that says T uh, T and N change with time, uh, and T is different for different organs. Our report should state what these are in the reports. I don't really quite understand that. I I guess the thing is the important thing is to uh, know which uh, edition of the T and M one's dealing with. I guess that's perhaps what what that question's getting at. Yeah. I'm more important thing is to define the land. So if you look at all the checklists, you need to talk about what you received and what the tumor is. I think that's more important. So once you define the location of the tumor, then define what kind of staging you are using. It should be assumed that you are using the right one for that particular location. Okay. Uh there's a question that just came up here. I'm trying to read her. Um, will not receive celiac and periodic lymph nodes in gallbladder cancers. Very for unresectable. I don't qu quite understand that question. I think I could guess, and uh, I've never seen one myself with the celiac dissection. So um, it's most of the time if they knew. There was celiac uh, lymph node involvement. It's been classified as non resectable. That will probably right. become a clinical staging. So, right. if you receive now, what I have seen is a patient with cholecystectomy who was diagnosed with cancer and then went back to have a uh, shy hepatectomy sent. So, I did the hepatectomy and it was positive. Now, reading the radiologic staging, it appears that there were invasion of the retroperitoneal lymph nodes around the uh, aorta and celiac axis. So clear in the radiology report. So what I did was I staged it from the pathology and I put it P stage and I have to put a comment. And I said the radiologist report is noted. This is true. This tumor will be staged as M1. But unless the radiologist said it is positive for metastasis, I don't check M1 because the M1 is P. M1. So it is pathologic evidence for metastasis. Now, this is the radiologist evidence, but for commission, because you don't know, you know who is in the report, it is helpful to be able to put it there as a comment and say there's a radiologist that suggests that we might be dealing with a P, with an M1 tumor, if uh, that group. So I think that is probably what most of us pathologists are going to be dealing with. Uh, most of the time, you are right. I've never seen one with distinction of all those group of lymph nodes myself. There's another question that popped up, Boyadeli, saying, I recently had a 6 kilogram HCC all over the place by HCC multiple nodules. Query coalesce or single T? <laughs> um, if you, a good question. So usually it's to be to have just one HCC replacing the entire liver right and left lobe. If you think they represent more than one lesion, it's probably more than one lesion. But if you look at the staging, obviously that tumor is going to be as bad as it gets, whether it's a single tumor or a multiple tumor, just based on the viral size, you know, of the tumor. And the more difficult problem Problem is knowing to use the checklist to flag the fact that there is more than one tumor in the liver. You know, it's really a problematic unless you adopt something like we did. It's just impossible the way the checklist. Are. I don't know why they they did that. Uh, you know, maybe because I work in a place where we see a lot of, of explants and almost always there is more than one tumor. Because when you are dealing with resection, where there's only one tumor that they are after. So I don't know, but when you see multiple tumor, it's very, very difficult. Uh, I will put a comment 
probably discuss with your uh, if you want to get a copy of our own modification. So the good thing about those checklists is that you could add to them. You can't take anything out of them, but you could add as much as you want to them, which is what we did. So we'll be happy to share with you. Uh, you can contact me and I will send you a rough draft and you could put it. So that would be the best way to go. Another question that popped up here is kind of truncated. It says uh, liver capsule invasion question mark pseudo capsule formation as in renal cell. Yeah. Again, that is a uh, um, examination is as good as your gross description. It's invading the capsule. Whoever is doing the gross is going to see it. And most tumors they will tell you the subcapsular and everything. Thing. So if they don't indicate that, and just shell out a tumor that has pseudo capsule around it, uh, you know you just have to go through that debate. Am I looking at the liver capsule? Or am I looking at the pseudo capsule? Now, I can use some of the things that will tell you this is the pseudo capsule of the tumor versus liver capsule, but none of them is uh, validated, and none of them is foolproof. So your gross description is as important as the microscopic. Uh, another comment in here. It says, uh, seems to me that recent radiolo radiology size of HCC is more definitive of size than path measurement. So versus path. The simple Who answer wins? to that is no. no. And, uh, so we, and then again, that's how you, you really need to be sure when you say it's 5 cm, that is 5 cm. But a lot of uh, experts that are restaged post transplant because the radiology measurement is uh, not exactly the same thing. Now, most of the time, I would say nine times out of ten, the men are at least very close and not significantly different from what we found. Uh, so it's not unusual that we find. But what is more common is uh, the radiologist missing small tumors. So the two that are less than 2 cm are very, very difficult to spot radiologically, even with the best radiologist. And they are not fully arterialized. Uh, even when they do their contrast uh, examination, they may still not be able to pick up. So it's not unusual for us to see the ones that they saw, get the measurement right, but in addition to that, you know, you see a few other tumors that were not uh, by radiologists. And here at UHN, our radiologists, are very, we work very closely together, and sometimes they will go back and look at the CT scan. You know, So when we, we are very good at locating where these extra nodules are. So if it's in left low, we don't just say left low, we say in segment 2 or segment 3. Because then we we'll go back and look at the CT scan and see, okay, yeah, there's something here that uh, for some reason. So this is a learning process uh, for them to... And getting better and better, picking up even the smaller ones now. There's another question that just came up: is How do you identify an ablation site? Uh, because well, if it's a successful ablation, the tumor is all necrotic and it looks like a tumor. All right, it's very friable is necrotic. Endoscopically, you see. So if it's radiofrequency ablation, the kind of necrosis that you see is more like a uh, you know, like cryotherapy. So these are dead. But you see the gold outlines, including the outlines of the nucleus. So it's, it's better shown than described. And you can bet grossly you will see it. And again, the radiologist will have told you where the tumor is anyway. So our PAs and pathologists there, we read the radiology report before we go down to gross. So we know how many tumors they found, we know where they are. And we lower them. It's not very difficult to, you know, to recognize it. There's another comment that came in from Hamilton that says uh, hepatic duct margins in our institution are identified with suture. And that any help that you can get from the surgeon is good help. You know, and you know sometimes grossly you not even be able to tell the hepatic artery from the bile duct. They are about the same size. If the bile is not green in the mucosa, you your guess may just be so. If your surgeons are 
I find everything that they could identify that is to be encouraged. I do sometimes if I think a margin could be important and I can't find it, I call the surgeon. And sometimes he or she doesn't come back same day or two days. Very good, they come down and we go through the specimen together and they will say, yes, <clears throat> this is the margin you are looking for and they will do this. And many of them are good if it's very critical they try to just shave it and submit it separately so better if you are so doing that please encourage them and take them out to coffee once in a while so i think that's all the the questions we've got now uh so we're going to bring uh the session to closure now so on behalf of cancer care ontario the canadian partnership against cancer and the canadian association of pathologists i'd like to thank dr eddie for a truly comprehensive informative and a clear presentation today. This is the first of our 2013 uh, CAP checklist presentation session. Uh, we would welcome your comments and suggestions for ways to improve these uh, sessions on a go-forward basis. Please include your feedback and suggestions as part of the completed online evaluations. Once the WebEx recording of this presentation becomes available, it will be made available widely through links from uh, Cancer Care Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists. As to this re recording will be available for review at, at your convenience and is not restricted. Uh, as a reminder, both the uh, live and the recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits. In order to receive these credits for attending or viewing the educational session, you must complete an evaluation form for each session that is accessed, viewed in its entirety. The link to the web-based survey has been included in the session notices that were prior, previously distributed. Please note that the CME certificates for each uh, CAP education session will only be available for one month from the presentation date. The sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but the certificates only for one month. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. So the, the next uh, session that we're going to be having is actually next Wednesday, January the 23rd, and it's going to be on the uh, the CAP checklist related to uh, vulva, vagina, and cervix. And we're really delighted to have Dr. William Chapman of St. Joseph's Hospital in Toronto uh, giving that session. So we look forward to seeing you uh, at that time. And uh, for the time being, uh, we close down uh, this session. Thank you very much.